Higuri tries to host a net battle competition for those that run the stores in his shopping district to drum up business, both for himself and the others struggling kiosks and stores in the wake of the Dark Void incidents. Only problem is, no one has bothered to enter, for Higuri and the other owners have offered a really terrible grand prize for it, which is just a 10 pound bag of rice. And that's a prize not even these kids would be after. And things go from bad to worse for the districts when their own brand of bad luck magnet takes the time to pass by. That being Shuko Kido, who is a very nice and well-mattered teen girl that is a continuous sad sack. And because she's a continuous sad sack, she doesn't pay attention to the things around her and gets into all sorts of accidents. And when she part-times at the stores, they then start experiencing the accidents themselves. It's actually why the district is having financial problems to begin with. The stores she helps out take hits they just can't get back from without more customers, which she has unintentionally scared away. The examples they list, though, seem more coincidental, as if they are misidentifying the causes of their poor luck and just blame the common correlative factor, instead of each person just suddenly having an off day or end up distracted by a new employee they have to supervise in learning the ropes more intently than others, thus miss the attention required to maintain their own. Now, I can kind of get some of these characters buying into this, Chisao and Rush in particular, but Mariko? Seriously? The woman is a teacher. Has she not ever had to deal with kids believing a strange kid is bad luck, and had to debunk that so said kid wouldn't be bullied like this? I mean, I know it's the moral of the episode, don't isolate from you those who have done no deliberate wrong or act of malice, and she later speaks out in condemnation of the act, but still to buy into Higuri's spiel when he's had no in-person interaction with her either? She's better than this. It honestly doesn't surprise me that this is, in fact, a Mayori Sekijima episode. Once again, looking up their productions, this seems to be a trope of theirs, that anyone slightly different has to be segregated from the normies, and persecuted for it. Believe it or not, while I sung the merits of the series Cross Age Rondo of Angels and Dragons during my review of Super Robot Wars V, Sekijima actually wrote one of the stronger episodes of the series dealing with and showcasing that exact arc for one of its major characters, and the psychological harm it can do to them, which accented the show's central core messages and themes. I've said before that Sekijima is one of the problem writers for this show, but it's because the recurring tropes of their style do not mesh well with the overall .exe timeline and the expectations of the character depictions that they have not handled well at all. <laughs> this, though? This more fits in their wheelhouse, and the only ones sacrificed to motivate it are shopkeepers we won't really see again, as opposed to Sekijima constantly screwing over the regular cast members. And because of all the crap Shuko's experienced, hell, she wants the rice as a prize. As she and her orphan brothers are so broke right now, they'd want to stretch that week's worth of rice into a month's worth supply. But since she really can't win if there's no other competitors, Neto, Mail, and Toru decide to help her out by entering as well so they can fake losses against her navi so she might win. And with that bit of confidence, maybe overcome that curse of hers which even she has come to believe in and propagate herself as true, which makes those even open to being close to her want to distance themselves from her. It's showcasing a cycle of abusive behavior, where even those who did no wrong come to blame themselves for it. So just how it starts raining literally the second she got here, as if she controls the water. And that's just wrong. Even more wrong to treat this as comedy. Not wrong to show it, mind you. You can write material like this in ways that make for a strong story about why people shouldn't be treated like this as it then serves as an object lesson against that behavior. The thing is, if you present it the wrong way though, you can end up either glorifying it, undermining representation of it, or have whatever subject matter you intend completely go over people's heads to the point that what the character tied to doing something bad is supposed to be bad, and you're not supposed to follow their example. You'd be surprised how frequently that keeps happening in modern critical analysis of media where that isn't considered. I actually saw someone relatively recently think the book 1984 is bad because of what's showcased in the book, and missed the entire point of the message of the book saying, Hey, isn't a society that makes all the fucked up horrible things in it's A-OK -okay to do really bad? 
let's do our best to make sure the real world doesn't turn out like it. With the companion to that being, Oh crap, conservatives keep trying to make the real world like 1984. Why aren't we stopping that? Anyways, the competition gets started. With the four, er, five, as Higori is also taking part, competitors being opened up to a battle royale matchup, which thus allows us to be introduced to Shuko's Navi, Aquaman, and his absolutely weaponized cuteness. Kawaii, kawaii I mean, how can you attack that face? Because, of course, the Japanese view of fanboys would make them default their depiction to being stereotypically sociopathic. How? Sure enough, their inability to want to attack Aquaman gets the better of them, and the four other navvies fall off the stage. Meaning Aquaman is defaulted to being declared the winner. And the other shoe is... There it is. Still, thanks to Neto and company's efforts before concerning how Higuri locked himself to one path of thought to his own detriment, part of why Higuri is actually being nice to Shuko overall is he sees the same thing happening to her. She's become too trapped in the idea that she's cursed and unlucky to be around, that anything good in her life will lead to worse calamities after her, and that his consequence is becoming self-fulfilling. She'll deliberately sabotage anything good with a negative thought or act to follow, which is nothing but self-destructive. And as someone who has had to deal with that himself, it is good for Igure's own development to want to help her break from that, and want help from the ones who broke him from that himself to make sure he doesn't screw it up. Uh, How? And yet, here's where we get to the root of the matter of what causes all of Shuko's horrible bad luck to spiral. Aquaman. Yes, every time Shuko gets overdramatic and starts to cry, Aquaman gets in his head the idea that, hey, maybe he can fix it. He then goes online and tries to correct something he can affect in cyberspace to resolve things, thus causing the calamities the other shopkeepers that had her on staff experienced. Eh, what can we say? The devil is a part-timer. In this case, Aquaman goes to the electric company and tries to hack it so Igure's shop gets back power, but ends up causing a mess when the security navvies for the power grid come to arrest him. His specialized abilities allowing him to unleash an absolute torrent in cyberspace that forces all of the security navvies out. And because he's acting independently, he doesn't know when to stop, which spirals into the power plant system regulation being all messed up, meaning the power plant's core could end up exploding. As always, when this type of thing occurs in fiction, there is a reason the primary control systems to all power production plants worldwide are not connected to a network and are otherwise maintained as isolated systems for the simplicity of knowing that nothing will get into it by which to potentially damage or destroy them. Like, when a plant has to shut down, it's usually because too much is being asked of it, or from a physical hardware failure, not a software issue because of exactly this concern. Thus, Nano gets Higuri to help him in stopping Aquaman, Higuri dragging along Shuko with them, as, with her being melodramatic and blaming herself as the Devil Girl, he started to get pissed off with her constant, Woe is me! attitude. She caused the situation specifically because of this attitude, and Aquaman wanting to make her feel better because of it. So if she feels she is responsible, it's time to stop acting like that and take responsibility for it. For what has she done to stop being cursed? Nothing. She just sobs in a corner feeling sorry for herself, and that's not helping anyone. Least of all, herself. With other cursed characters, they hate their abysmal luck stat, they really do, but most choose to not be hampered by it and do their best regardless of that handicap, as they refuse to let their awful luck win. Shuko, on the other hand, has let it beat her down every chance it gets without a fight, and that is why it keeps getting worse, as she takes no action against it and just lets it run wild. This is the self-destructive attitude I was talking about that needs to be addressed with her. And that is what Higuri eventually snaps at her over in tearing down this mentality. 
The unfortunate side of this, though, is Aquaman's water attacks act as a barrier against their shots hitting, to the point even powerful chips aren't doing jack against him. It's once they confront Shuko's attitude, though, that they get the tip needed to stop her navy, plug the hole where water is released from it, and it should stop the waves it's releasing. Thus, to best target the hole... This shorts Aquaman out, returning the system to normal. And to make sure Shuko doesn't relapse into her prior mental state, Higuri decides to take her on as a part-timer in a shop himself. Even though, as always, it doesn't seem like much was learned at all. The wrap-up. We have the devil you know, for Shuko's attitude towards herself created bad luck. We have aborted tournament arc for the shopping district tournaments. We have cyberspace tsunami for Aquaman's antics at the end. We have Curse Breaker, for Rigori trying to get through to Shuko. We have I've Got Soul, for Rockman gaining another soul form. And we have Actor Illusion for... Wait, am I reading this right? So, uh, the dub kind of did a thing with Shuko and Aquaman that some people picked up on. Partly because by the time this was airing in the West, it was 2005. Chantal Strand was cast to voice Shuko in English markets. And she is better known to most people for being the original Bandai Ocean dub actress for Lacus Klein and her body double Mir Campbell from the Gundam Seed series, as well as voicing Feld Grace in Gundam Double O. Yes, yet another Gundam Double O cast member was part of this on either side of the voice cast line. And it is believed in reference to her role in Seed that Aquaman's English voice actor was chosen to be Matt Hill, the original English voice actor for Seed's protagonist and Lacus's paramour, Kira Yamato. Whether this is a jab at Kira being considered the most in-touch and expressive with their emotions gun a protagonist or not, due to them not choosing to hide their inner turmoil in order to acknowledge and work through it, well, we're just gonna have to take a mulligan on analyzing that aspect of why he was chosen for this, and hand wave it to Matt and Chantal consistently working well together. Which, by the list of other series they both worked on together, they do. By contrast, Shuko's Japanese actress Mamiko Noto is both better and less known. Her most notable role was that of Rin from Inuyasha, with subsequent roles, at least the ones from series I know, including Tefania Westwood from Familiar of Zero, perpetual background character Aisa Himagami in the Rail Deck series, Moriko Morioka from Recovery of a MMO Junkie, and Skithach from Fate Grand Order. Her counterpart for Aquaman as well is Chiami Chiba, who is otherwise best known for being Doremi Harukaze in Ojamajo Doremi and by comparison, not much else of note, to the point that her tenure as Aquaman is considered one of her largest roles. Which is kind of unfortunate, as while well, Shuko and Aquaman are recurring characters for the rest of the series, it's not exactly a high point for their career. Matt Hill and Chantal Strand, outside of their seed characters, at least did other things they're noted and known for. Beyond that, though, well, honestly, this is the best episode Mayuri Sikijima's written for the series thus far. There's an actual nuanced message critique here, both in regards to how someone can self-sabotage themselves, and how society around them can make it worse. And you get a positive spin on Sekijima's frustrating insistence on the status quo being shot, with Higure being the one to push forward this change, while still introducing the character in such a way that Neto can build a rapport with her to eventually allow him to access Aqua Soul. This one thus was overall a decent outing, and it's the first one to give Neto a Blue Moon-based soul unison as well since thus far, all the others have rooted themselves from Red Sun. But it's not the only one in this block. After all, next on the docket is the opportunity for a Savage rematch. <laughs>